Great. Uh, good evening to uh, members, education uh, co-optees, guests, and members of the public watching on YouTube. Uh, now I think we've got okay. It's back to back to normal. Um, welcome to the second meeting of the Children's Mental Health, Wellbeing, and Resilience Scrutiny Panel. Um, the agenda for this meeting is on the Ealing Council website. So if you're watching as a member of the public, uh, if you Google Ealing Democracy, you'll be able to navigate to it from there. Um, I'd like to especially welcome the external witnesses who'll be presenting to us later. Uh, we have got quite a full agenda tonight. So can I encourage um, everyone presenting and asking questions to be concise? So turning to the agenda, we begin with item one, apologies for absence. Um, I've received apologies from Councillor Linda Burke and from education co-optees, Dr. Marianne Eisen and Josephine Spencer. Does anyone know of uh, any other apologies? Um, there are no other apologies, Chair. Great, okay, thanks. Um, so um, item two, urgent matters, uh, there are none. Um, item three, matters to be considered in private. Uh, there are none. Um, there was discussion at the pre-meeting about taking some confidential evidence, but we felt on balance that it was better to keep the meeting in public throughout uh, rather than do that. Um, so th so there's, there's nothing to be considered in private. Um, item four, declarations of interest. Uh, so please uh, raise your, your Zoom hand if you have a declaration of interest to make. Don't, I don't, oh yes, that's right. Uh, so, um, Tracy, um, I mean, normally it would only be um, members that, that declared it, but go ahead. Oh no, I was only letting you know I'm a school governor for Ealing, uh, for Greenford High School, that's all. Okay. Um, I I think that, yeah, I, I, I don't think we need to, so thanks for letting us know, but I don't think we need to record that because um, I think... Uh, I think I'm right that uh, it's only members of the, of the committee that need to declare interests, but thanks for letting us know. Great, so nothing else. Uh, great, um, so now on to the minutes. So I'll go through these page by page. Um, so please raise your Zoom hand if you have a correction to make on a page. We'll start with item, or item page one of the minutes, which is page five of the whole bundle. Uh, so yeah, page page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine page 10, and finally page 11. Great, um, so it doesn't sound like there were any issues. Uh, so does the panel approve the minutes as a correct record? Yeah. Yes, I'm getting, I'm getting some, some assent there. Yeah. yeah. Good, so they agreed, great, uh, thank yeah. you. So we now move on to the, the first substantive uh, item, uh, which is item six. The work undertaken on the mental health and well-being of young people in local colleges and universities. Um, the item is a, a, a presentation that's been uh, put together jointly by a number of witnesses and we'll be hearing from um, officers Angela McKeever, Benita Nichols and Alison Delius and from external witnesses Sarah Woodward, Assistant Principal Quality and Student Services at West London's College. Tracy McAuliffe, Director of Student Services at the University of West London, and Olivia Tedman, Advice Service Manager at the UWL Students' Union. And then we'll then take questions on the whole, the whole presentation at the end. Um, will um, Angela McKeever um, start the presentation off, please? Thank you, Councillor. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, so um, this part of this evening's meeting, we will be considering the um, mental health and the support provided um, by education and training institutions and employers, for example, such as the council, to support um, young people 
uh, through COVID and beyond. We've got a range of speakers, as, as Councillor Ball has just mentioned. We're going to start with um, evidence from the Council's Apprenticeship Scheme and the Pastoral Support Worker who has supported directly the young people on the scheme uh, through very, very critical times. Then we'll pass over to um, hearing from the West London College and the University of West London. So we hope it's quite a comprehensive overview of what young people have experienced, but also what institutions and employers have put in place to support them through um, COVID and, and into the current period. So I'm not going to say much more because we've got a lot to get through, but I will hand now to Vanita Nichols, who um, is Acting Head of Employment and Apprenticeships of the Council. So over Thank to Vanita. Much. Thank you. Yes. So um, uh, if we can go to the straight to the first slide, because I know time is of the essence. So we have at the Council a number of programmes and these, some of these have been put in place um, many years ago and some you'll recognise like Kickstart, which are much newer. We've had a Council Apprenticeship Scheme since 2007 and since the beginning we've always had a pastoral support worker recognising that young people may need additional support. Um, we've had a Pathways programme since 2012, which is a pre-apprenticeship programme, six month paid work placements with again training and mentoring support. And then people are more familiar with traineeships, work placements with training and again mentoring and the council kickstart scheme, which um, we've had in place since September and uh, no, since way since the summer. And uh, that's an employment support programme along with paid work placement and again, the essential one of having a mentor in there. And the council also is uh, sponsoring a supported internship program with the college. These are supported work rotations, but the essential part of that are the job coaches. So each time the mentoring and the support is essential for retention and the well-being of the young people. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so since the pandemic, though, these are the sorts of things that we have been noticing. Um, so high levels of unemployment in the borough, uh, in fact, the ACC, the alternative claimant count, uh, started at 9,000 people before um, the pandemic and has now risen up to 23,000 people. So there are a lot of people out there who are not economically active. And at the same time, there are an awful lot of opportunities that have been developed through um, uh, with providers and um, the colleges and employers but they don't seem to be coming forward and taking those uh, places up. So what we found is that there is a general loss of confidence with young people and it's difficult to even get them to, onto a programme. Um, there's also a real and a perceived Ooh. sense of increase of in competition for jobs. Uh, the, the mental health issues in general, such as anxiety and nervousness about going into the workplace, and a general disengagement. People are waiting things out to see what happens and to see if there is some solid ground again. Um, so uh, for the apprenticeship scheme, what the council did straight away was we could see, but in, we remember how we had no idea what was going to happen. And we had some apprentices who were coming near to the end of their contracts. So the first thing that happened was uh, those contracts were extended. And thankfully, that really helped. Along with, of course, we had a directive. Everybody needed to work from home uh, because we couldn't be in a, a common workplace anymore. And also our pastoral support worker worked long, uh, long hours to support our young people in those placements. She will be telling you more about that in just a moment. Um, but it did mean that we were able to retain our apprentices and indeed progress them now that things have shifted and are a little bit more balanced and we know uh, better what's happening. Um, I'm leaping to our what we're going to do as a next step and that is we've already been in touch with a number of organisations such as Mind and Twining. Um, uh, we want to get together with those uh, people and work in partnership to try and create an offer to young people. How can we work together to um, encourage people to come back out to get the support they need and then join the programmes that we have on offer? Uh, so thank you. And now I hand over to Alison Delius, who's our pastoral support worker. 
Thank you, Benita. Can you all hear me? Um, I'm hoping you can. Um, so um, if we can move the slide along, Diana. Thank you so much. OK, so I'm a, a personal advisor, but also work as a pastoral support worker. Um, on the uh, apprenticeship scheme. So I've look, looked at issues experienced since the, since the lockdown, since the beginning, um, and we've got general anxiety, and that is anxiety raised around going to work and then perhaps coming back into work, um, and um, also anxiety around um, that vaccination, information about, information about things like that. Um, mild depression, uh, lack of motivation, dropping output, relationship issues, exhaustion, insomnia, uh, parenting small children, anxiety due to pre-existing conditions such as autism, uh, eating disorders, OCD, there's lots of, uh, of um, those sorts of things. So um, the way we supported them, it's one-to-one -one conversations um, and in some cases we can look at action planning such as looking at diet and exercise and things like that. Um, we can advocate with the um, line manager, um, increasing the number of pastoral support meetings, so checking in, um, sometimes just checking in every day with them and then weaning them off that is really, really effective. Um, meeting with the manager and apprentice so that um, to help the apprentice to articulate what they're struggling with, what, what's been difficult and to try to figure out a way to, um, to make that better between the two. Um, referrals, occupational health, workplace options, IAPT, uh, mind, rape crisis, shelter, relate, citizen, citizen advice. Those are all places that I've signposted our young people to during this um, period. Extensions of apprenticeship um, and placements, and that's what Vanita's talked about earlier, which took away a lot of the anxiety about what was going to happen next. Um, staggered return to work after illness when we had um, a number of them who had actually got COVID. And also flexible hours for parents and carers, because there were a number of those on the scheme as well. We can move on again, please. OK, so we're just looking at a case study. I appreciate everyone can obviously read it, but I'm just going to go through it with you. So we're all um, we're all looking at the same stuff. OK, so a young apprentice, she had problems at school um, and was permanently excluded at 14. She joined the scheme. It was immediately clear that she was producing good quality work. Um, she had a history of issues and relationship around uh, mother and home. And she, this is where she lived with her mother. Uh, pressure of confined living space uh, during the COVID lockdown led her to need needed to leave home which was difficult at this period during the pandemic um, support provided including many hours discussing issues a referral to Ealing children's integrated response services because she still fell within that, that age range and they engaged with her uh, in this case I, enc I encouraged her to speak to a line manager so that the line manager could also offer support uh, which they did and they had an understanding of her circumstances plan was devised for her to stay with grandmother temporarily I spoke to her daily at that point because the mother the relationship with grandmother was very very difficult um she was also suffering from a lack of motivation as you can imagine finding it hard to sleep uh we discussed counseling um which she um applied for which she went and, and spoke to a gp but while she was waiting for that we've we talked about practical things that she could do um which was daily walks when it was safe um because she had stopped going out bedtime routine diet um, she was also missing a dog, which is a great source of comfort to her, but it was still with the mother. Uh, I encouraged her to take a week's leave from work to plan her life and plan her time to, in order to uh, address some of the issues. When lockdown eased, she contacted her mother and arranged a visit uh, to walk the dog, as well as getting in touch with friends via iPhone and Zoom. If we could move on, please. Uh, when she returned to work, her sleep pattern was better and she made some progress managing her relationship with her mother. Eventually, post lockdown, she returned home, but only temporarily. She became much happier. Uh, and when we discussed her plans for moving out with a plan that would work for her financially. So rather than moving out in an emergency situation, planning, moving out uh, and having her own independent living. Uh, unfortunately, after a while, her output at work started to drop and she said she felt a bit low. She wasn't sure why. So we discussed it and looked at a mood diary, which highlighted the times of the day when she was feeling low and ways of countering it, eating, rehydrating, going for a walk and talking to, to a friend or me. At this time, I was speaking to her uh, daily because of the situation that was going on. And obviously she was struggling to keep her coursework going and to maintain the changes that had happened at work as well. So when, when 
we then spoke to line manager about getting permission to be able to work at the council office one day per week. We thought that that might offer some structure um, during the lockdown. Um, and directive at that time was to remain from remain working from home and not at the office. And this was agreed and has been really beneficial to her output and general mood as it had improved. Um, she still struggles with change and uh, her, when she achieved her level two, moved on to level three, had similar issues with motivation and output because moving on to level three meant a different manager and she built up this relationship with that manager. So my job was to, to try to encourage the discussion and the support, um, which the manager was obviously going to give, but to encourage the young person to talk to the manager about what was going on for her. Um, it's got something to do with her self-doubt and her abilities in terms of motivation and output. Uh, again, met with her more regularly to discuss the issues and we devised a plan to help with addressing practical tasks as well as spending time asking, uh, talking about her issues. She continues on her apprenticeship journey and is progressing well. Many of the issues she has had have been typical of many of young apprentices I've worked with during the pandemic. So it's, it's, it's a, a series of, of dipping, everything going fine, dipping again, everything going fine. But the important thing is she's caught up with her coursework, she's making progress in her placement and she's doing really well at the moment. Um, if we could move on, I I'm not sure if that's the end of mine. Okay, so now we've got a couple of um, quotes from the apprentices here. Um, so one is a mother of two working from home. Uh, it was a particularly difficult time for me when I started my apprenticeship as it was during the lockdown and none of us knew what to expect. Working from home made it difficult to learn the new role as there was little interaction uh, possible with colleagues. Other factors also came to play such as homeschooling the children at a time uh, at home all the time while working from home. And, and in this case, although these are her words to just to explain, uh, this person, this young person thought that, um, that she couldn't ask for help or she couldn't um, reveal her situation. Um, so the pastoral support helped me to manage my time better. Um, to be able to deal with everything going on, including understanding the importance of my own mental health and learning how to take time out for myself and ensure that I got support from colleagues when needed. So it's important to point out that those things were available in the workplace and she needed to just explain or, or ask for them or reach out and, and get them. Uh, apprentice two, uh, apprentice with autism and parent with health vulnerabilities. So what happened with apprentice two is that they were in a different part of the house, the rest of the family, when lockdown happened and were there for a number of weeks. I found the pastoral support extremely essential at a time when I was self-isolating in my home and had to be away from other family members. I had some human contact virtually on a near daily basis and was the difference between me coping and failing to adapt. This lockdown was a new situation making me apprehensive even in my own home. Pastoral support I received helped me with a link to the outside world and support to manage my situation. So those are two quotes that we've got from apprentices that have uh, the, that have worked uh, along with the pastoral support. And I'm not sure if that's the uh, the end of my, yes, it is. So thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, and as I say, we'll take the questions at the end of the whole of the whole presentation, because I think some of the answers um, may, uh, may, may cross over. It may be useful to have answers from different witnesses. So, um, now, um, can uh, Sarah Wood Woodward, uh, sorry, um, please uh, present the, um, the 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 section from the point of view of West London College? Thank you for inviting me this evening. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Good. Um, I'm just going to talk about provision at West London College. Which, if we can go on to the slide, second slide. Um, just in terms of our context, we have campuses at Hammersmith, Ealing, Southall and Park Royal um, and approximately 1900, just under 2000, 16 to 18 year olds in college and around 10,000 learners aged 19 plus. Many of those will be part time learners. 400 learners aged 16 to 25 with education and healthcare plans and high needs. So um, a, a vulnerable um, population within our community, around 400 apprentices. Um, two th thirds of our learners come from black and minority ethnic communities. Um, and I think it's really important to paint that picture that, that in terms of our, I'm the safeguarding lead. And in terms of our safeguarding referrals last year, 
you know, we see overwhelmingly the primary concern for over a third, um, a, a range of mental health difficulties. Um, I would also go as far to say that there's a far higher number because it's often a secondary, a secondary factor in a young person and adults um, difficulties and challenges. Um, and the presenting issues are overwhelmingly anxiety, depression, stress. And I think what we saw last year, particularly, we did see a massive sort of knock on effect from lockdown, which I'll, I'll describe in a bit more detail. Um, a growing proportion concerning the of our students were expressing suicidal thoughts. Four students were hospitalised for attempted suicide. Uh, last year and what we're seeing is the level and complexity of mental health needs has increased sort of on previous years we are already seeing that trend but it's definitely now increased um, we commission mind and have done for some years um, we have a full-time uh, well-being worker so our commissioned well-being service worked with around 120 students and this service tends to focus on um, you know early intervention um, it, where, where we have a, a, a learner with very severe concerns they might make that early first kind of contact with them but then we will obviously refer them directly on to uh, primary and secondary mental health services externally. Next slide please. Um, our mental health work falls within a, a sort of a safeguarding framework, the statutory framework, keeping children safe in education which sort of is the framework for our work with um, under 18s and, and legislation around vulnerable adults. We're also, as a college, inspected under the Ofsted um, inspection framework, where they obviously look at our safeguarding um, robustness, rule, um, policies, procedures, and the work that we do around mental health and well-being as part of that and other factors, the personal development aspects. Um, we, we have to re ensure that staff have all read and understood part one of keeping children safe in education. That happens every September. We're doing it now. We're quizzing staff. We're checking their understanding. Um, and staff re receive regular sort of safeguarding child protection training. And we're also now doing um, mental health training and support for, for many staff throughout the college. Um, and we have really always review our procedures and policies to ensure that we're really identifying issues at the earliest opportunity and referring them through. Um, and students are taught about safeguarding, online safety, um, and not to be fearful of talking to us about personal difficulties and challenges and problems. I'll give you some examples of those slides for our induction a bit later in my presentation. And obviously we have to have a designated safeguarding lead who's a senior uh, member of the team in the college and that's myself we can go on please um we work we have a lot of partnerships um we have a you know it is an increasingly challenging area in terms of you know enabling our learners to learn and thrive and progress we have to deal with all those challenges they face um so as i said we rain, we work with a range of partners not just to sort of deal with the mental health but promote good emotional health be proactive um so we have a full-time mind well-being service we work with the west london nhs trust a program called back on track GPs, CAMs, primary mental health teams, young minds, and we always make um, you know, our learners aware of all those services that they can access outside of college hours like COOTH. Um, we also have a new safeguarding and wellbeing officer. Um, we, 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 we're building that team, and this particular person we've recruited is one of our former MIND employees. So we're actually building the mental health expertise within our safeguarding team, and he's also trained in cognitive behavioural therapy. So we're getting some real expertise around working directly with our learners, as well as bringing in external professionals and referring outwardly. And we're signed up to the Association of Colleges, our professional organisation's mental health charter. We prioritise mental health amongst our, our learners and our staff. Next slide, please. Um, this is very, I'm not going to go through all of this, but this is just a 
kind of flavor of the work that happened during lockdown. You know, you'll all remember as we approached that date, you know, we knew we were going into lockdown in education. And so we had some very frenzied days as our student numbers plummeted and we were busy putting plans together. We called them COVID-19 functional area plans. And I had to produce one for safeguarding mental health well-being. And what we basically did with those was we identified all of our vulnerable learners, anyone known to safeguarding. Everyone was allocated a link worker with various sort of levels of expertise, de depending on the need of that vulnerable learner. And it was then our jobs as we went into lockdown to contact them, not just through email, but by phone, you know, any method we could. And because we already had a Google Classroom platform, our teachers moved very quickly to a remote learning environment. And we la launched a remote referral procedure to identify, you know, for me, the key thing was we needed to identify any students who weren't coping, who we didn't necessarily already know to the safeguarding team um, who, who might require higher levels of support. So we constantly checked in online and we followed up non-engagement. We continued to work with police, social services, primary mental health to support ongoing and some new safeguarding casework that was identified. Um, and I think we had a really clear awareness in college of the potential impact of coronavirus and lockdown on the mental health of our learners and staff. So we really tried to be as proactive as possible. And um, the mind wellbeing advisor was really proactive, working online, taking referrals from teams and supporting through sort of direct telephone support sessions with learners and also online. And as we kind of came out of the lockdown but had that sort of summer break, students, the majority hadn't had to come back to college. So we continued that mind provision right through the summer until we came back into college in September. We also had a weekly newsletter that we put out electronically to students and parents and we had all sorts of links in there around well-being resources and who to contact, direct numbers if there were any concerns. And just going back to our last presenter, you know, like trying to advise, like, focus on your sleeping routines, you know, get dressed during the day, take some exercise, because we did find that insomnia and sleeplessness was a real issue for our learners. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, that was lockdown and these are the sorts of things as we come back into college, some of the things that we use to raise awareness, you know, to try and draw learners in who might need support. We write about um, safeguarding mental health and our services in a student handbook, which all learners have a copy of, through induction, which is delivered through our tutors and through pastoral staff, talking to learners in their tutorial time. We have safeguarding posters around the college campuses, different teams of all of us, you know, who to contact in a, if you have a concern, as well as your tutor. Um, we post stuff in Google Classroom, which is used by the tutors. So there are links in the student's Google Classroom if they want to make a self-referral or speak to someone um, with a self-referral form. And our student lose letter continues weekly where we always put, we put a lot of mind resources out and tip, top tips about how to stay healthy physically, emotionally. Um, I'm gonna show you some extracts, the next slide of this year's student induction. So this is part of, this is just an extract of a larger presentation and the sorts of things we would say to students. If we go to the next slide, um, this is part here, you know, just saying to students, you know, some of the presentation is sensitive. Um, it might be difficult, you know, facing it, it, issues that you face yourself, which are difficult and that you may not be able to discuss. And so we really try and draw them in. You know, we can help you. Please do talk to someone. Your tutor can be any member of staff who you feel able to approach or the college's safeguarding team. Our big message is that safeguarding, taking um, offering you support and help is everybody's responsibility. It's just everybody's responsibility. Next slide, please. Um, and so we also get this message across to our learners, you know, that word safeguarding, Ofsted will ask them, how safe do you feel in college? Do you know who to talk to? 
if you've got a concern about yourself, your well-being. Um, and so we also stress that we listen to concerns, treat them with sensitivity and, you know, with confidentiality, unless we have a concern about the risk to themselves or others, in which case we would have to tell someone else. So, and we explain that we are a sort of experienced team and that we also have specialist mental health, emotional well-being staff who can support them. And I must say our mind service is extremely popular. Um, we are now only what, three weeks into term and we are so busy um, currently working with learners with a range of, range of needs. Um, and so our overarching aim at the end of the day is to support our students in dealing with and overcoming those barriers to learning and helping them thrive. Next slide, please. Um, so sometimes just the visuals to get that message across, you know, talk to us, uh, don't, don't suffer in silence. Next slide, please. Okay, and we, we stress that your mental and emotional health is a priority for us. Um, I won't read that slide for you, but I think for me, especially when we went into the second lockdown, the message to every tutor is, you know, you may not even see the face behind the camera if your students try and get your students to put the camera on in Google Classroom, but never ever take a smiling face as being that everything is okay, because it may not be. And I will give you a case of an Ealing learner very quickly. So it was a learner from Ealing after the last lockdown and after college. So it would have been at the end of June, this particular 17 year old male, we had no concerns about, he achieved a level two merit in creative media, had a psychotic breakdown. Um, and I was contacted as part of a serious case review in the autumn. Um, he was hospitalized from July 2020 to February 21, and it was diagnosed as the impact of lockdown. Now, what the reintegration process, because I'm delighted to say that learner is back with us this year. He had a year out and we're now working with him and mental health professionals. He has a, he has, um, a mental health care worker. Um, and he's come back to do a level one course, which is less pressurized for him to reintegrate into learning. And by making those, you know, those co contacts, obviously with the externals, and we know his history, we're able to now risk assess him and work with him and support him back into college after a very, very difficult year. And he's actually talked to me about it. And it's a very sad story of lockdown where he and his own is a, sing, a child on his own with his mother. And it was actually his mother that started to get more and more withdrawn and wouldn't get out of bed. And then he started the same and it all ended up in this massive breakdown. Um, but we can then support a learner like this back on their journey and he's back with us and doing brilliantly. So college is also about reintegration from difficulties that young people and adults have faced. Uh, next slide, and I think I'm just about finished. So just to sort of summarise, yet yeah, I won't read through them. These are all the things we do as a college to promote the well-being and mental health of our students. Um, safeguarding with the big S, capitals. Um, I'm absolutely passionate about um, supporting and, and ensuring our learners have the resources, the support they need for any difficulty they have. We are continuing to grow and develop our mental health provision and expertise, working in partnership and making sure that we, we get our, our access even, even swifter and easier. So learners feel able to, to come and tell us when they're, when they're having difficulties. And ultimately our governing body, I report to the governing body very regularly. The governing body take a great interest in our provision, in the needs of the learners and the college and how we're responding to that. So um, we're highly accountable as well. And I think that's everything. Uh, th thank you, Sarah. Um, as I say, we'll we'll have questions at the end of the whole of the whole presentation. Um, so now we turn to uh, Tracy McAuliffe um, to start the the presentation from the uh, University of West London. Hello. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Well, thank you for inviting us. So myself and Olivia are just going to go through our presentation and really of what, all the effects that we've had through COVID and in how we supported our students through their mental health. 
So next slide, please. So just to give you a little bit of background of the university, so you need to understand the context of our learners, really. We are fundamentally, and our mission is a widening participation institution with high social mobility, and it's traditionally from underrepresented groups, and we have a high mature learners. So we have 12,500 students, um, and they're just broken down. Just to give you a bit of a background, there's 63% of our students are from a BAME background, which compared to the sector is only 31%. So we're double um, in our institution on that. 60% of our students are female, which is 4% higher than the national average. And 57% of our students are mature, which in our world is now 21 and over. And the sector average of that is around 28%. So that's just to give you a little bit of a background of the institution. Yeah, and from the SU, um, we overall have an engagement uh, of 54% of the students from the university, um, which is sector leading. We are the number one SU in the in the country. Um, so we are very well known for engaging our students in a number of different activities, which we'll go on to later. Um, as you can see from the breakdown, uh, we engage 63% of 18 to 21 year olds, 52.1% uh, of 22 to 25 year olds, and 50% of 26 to 30 year olds. And it is also important to note that a large majority of these students are pan London. Uh, they also have, have caring responsibilities um, and travel quite some time to get to, to the university. Um, in the year of 2019, 2020, so just pre-COVID, we engaged 63.3% of, of our students. Um, so the fact that we still remained over 50%, having lost a lot of in-person activity, um, is, a, is a positive for us. Next slide, please. OK, we also just wanted to give you the key areas within the university and within the UWLSU. So obviously the student is at the heart of everything we do in the institution. Um, because of the figures I told you previously, it was important that with lockdown, we actually all went online within 24 hours of it being announced by the government. So when it was announced on the Thursday, by the Monday morning, we told all of our students that we was going in obviously into lockdown, we would be supporting them online and gave them all of the links that they needed to come through. So with that, in our disability, we have 1,968 students that are registered with a disability. So to register in our service, we've only got 1,125 because it's not compulsory. Of that, there's 471 of those with a mental health condition. So we have a high volume that we have to support uh, in the institution through their studies, obviously, and outside the studies. And it was really key for us for that online process, not only teaching, but the whole support mechanism that you can see was on offer to our students immediately. And they had that seamlessness um, from the in sort of in-person teaching and an in-person information straight onto online. Yeah, and within the SU, uh, just as Tracy said, we've had to adapt our services as well. We also was able to get our academic service up running within 24 hours. Um, and a lot of the different areas, as you can see here, so the community and belonging team, partnership team, we was able to incorporate this online so that students can still engage and contact with our um, with the different the, the relevant teams when possible. Um, in the last academic year, 2020 to 2021, uh, we was able to support 800 students with academic advice cases. Um, ranging from needing an extension to fitness to practice or fitness to study panels. Um, and we've also been able to have people such as school reps and course reps incorporated within different um, cohorts, getting students feedback from within um, and feeding that back to us so we can alter and support students throughout. Next slide, please. OK, so one of the things that we've always offered at the institution is 24 hour support. So myself and four of my heads are actually on call 24 hours from our security. If anything happens to do with homelessness or if something is going wrong in their lives financially um, and they actually need some support for us. We've also throughout COVID, we introduced a new platform called Together Rule, which I'll talk to about later. And we also developed an online um, student hub. So that enabled our students to actually contact us or be in contact with us and book appointments as and when they need to. 
which was really quite important, obviously, for our students because it was at their benefit and at their timing rather than ours. Yeah, and within the SU, um, you know, we can see the work that Tracy was doing and, and the fact that, you know, they were supporting a large amount of students. But in the SU, we also wanted to kind of work alongside them um, and reach out to students that didn't really engage with the university and find out what was going on with them, if they needed any support. So what we did was we contacted over 6,000 students um, throughout COVID to check in, see how they are, to signpost them back to Tracy and, and her team and um, to let them know about the support available. Uh, during these outreach calls, we also identified a number of themes. So that was things such as IT poverty. So students who unfortunately were not able to engage in online activity, uh, go to, you know, classes online because they didn't have a computer or they only had one computer between a household of maybe four people and their children um, so what we did is we got some information and we fed it back to Tracy within the, the, the university. So obviously from the institution's position once we've got that information about our students the key part was to engage them still online so we set up different schemes as you can see there we did an IT loan scheme which we started then we did a discount purchase scheme with some suppliers. The main thing outside, when we had locked full lockdown, but as soon as we could open up, the key part for us was to reopen our library and actually reopen safe areas that students could come in and use the IT equipment um, and all the software that they needed behind it. And that really was one of the massive things for us. As part of that as well, the government also um, awarded us the Office of Students via the government, I should say, awarded us 463,000 um, throughout a period of about three months. And in that, that was to support these students with a COVID hardship fund. Um, and that could be used for anything that they needed, whether it's to do with, as you'd have seen in the media, double accommodation costs. It would have been for IT equipment. It would have been anything to do with their rent or just general hardship of living with no money. So out of that, we had two, just over 2,000 applications. We awarded 926 of those students um, that got funded, and they generally had a fund of each person who was given is £500 to try and make it fair and to get it across as many students as possible at that time. Yeah, and within the Student Union, uh, what we did is once Tracy and her team told us about this uh, COVID hardship fund, we used the resources that we had, which was our advice team, to support students who may have difficulties with either completing the application or just knowing about it. So we would look back on, on students that we felt may be um, eligible for this fund, reach out to them, let them know. We'd also check applications and make sure that they had enough evidence uh, to put forward uh, to, to receive the, this hardship fund. As you can see, we've also, we've done a lot of work with, you know, reaching out to students, identifying issues and supporting them. But we wanted to take a more of a holistic approach. So what we did was we'd also, uh, you know, help to support students who were in isolation or students who may just be in difficult times. So the Student Union, we delivered hundreds of fresh fruit and veg parcels to student accommodations um, and to students who was in isolation. In addition to that, the university set up with um, the aid of Morrison's, we sort of had an agreement and we actually delivered any student that was in isolation. We actually delivered like the non-perishable goods so that they could actually have that for the two week period that they had to stay in isolation and didn't feel that they was alone as well. And then from that, we also run our mental health webinars. The part of the webinars was really supporting students through COVID. It was about how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep your well-being up? How do we mentally um, keep you on track, not only for academia, but just for your mental well-being while you're at home, stuck at home, possibly on your own, or trying to cope with sharing devices with your children and everybody else that's also in that household? And for us at the Student Union, uh, we kind of wanted to take a similar approach, but in a way which worked well for us. So we have a very large following on social media. We've got over 4,000 people on Instagram alone, and we've got over 7,000 people that like our Facebook page. So that's just two, two um, social media platforms. So what we did was we launched a lockdown hub, which was a area of our website, which contained a number of different resources available to 
students and to anyone who really needed it. Um, and that would contain things such as virtual events, such as online yoga. Uh, there would be cooking competitions and, you know, uh, easy, easy menus and recipes, um, as well as some resources from Mind um, to help with uh, mindfulness and self-care. Um, and it would also have a lot of resources for students to a lot of resources and contact information for students if they ever felt that they needed it. Uh, we also, as part of that, set up the buddy scheme, which allowed for any student who had, you know, similar interests um, to kind of pair up with another student. And kind of, it was kind of like a pen pal. And we have a large amount of international students. So, you know, those students were very much at risk of, of feeling isolated and therefore having an effect on their mental health. So we set up the buddy scheme to kind of pair people up and kind of help them find a friend. And finally, what we did uh, at the latter end of, of lockdown is we would do retention and reset calls. So what that was, was we spoke to the university and we got some student information about any students who were at risk of being withdrawn from university or needing a reset. And this would ultimately affect their progression going forward. So again, kind of similar to the outreach calls, myself and a number of the staff within the student union called every single student who required a reset and checked in with them to make sure that first of all they was aware second of all if they needed any additional support and as well just to let them know if they did need it how they can access it uh, in a total we reached over 1,000 students and because of that we was able to you know stop hundreds of students being withdrawn from, from university which was a great result for us so the other thing the university introduced was a single um, session therapy model. So prior to um, COVID, we was often have, a, it would be a six week block that a student would sign up for a counselling session. Sometimes it didn't always turn up for the six weeks. So it actually has limitations for the number of counsellors. So what we did just before COVID hit, we actually introduced this single therapy session. What that means is the students come for one session they decide do they need further because sometimes they just wanted to talk to somebody there and then get off the chest what they felt, whatever they was feeling. And then they go, I don't need to come back. So we left it open to the students. What it has done this year means that we have no waiting list, uh, which we're really proud as a counselling service not to have a waiting list for over a year. Whereas prior to that, we'd have about a six to seven week waiting list for students to come in and see us which in conjunction, obviously, you can appreciate with the NHS is next to nothing of what you would wait in the NHS. So moving that service, especially around COVID, has really made a, our, a safe campus is what we'd look at in their mental well-being um, because they can come into us at any point. Part of it as well, they can have a two week break and then they can come back again. So it's not a thing you come once and you can never come again. It isn't like that. Um, so we do have some repeat students, obviously, that come back and then they may take the further six weeks that we also offer. What we did find from that last year, we had 576 students actually come for our counselling service, which on the previous year, that is a 40 percent increase, which is massive, as you can appreciate um, in that COVID. And what I can say from that, really proud to say we didn't have any suicides throughout COVID as an institution. And I know some other institutions have, which is sad, but I think the management for us of how we're working with these people uh, with their mental health is really quite key, which would lead me on to the next slide and our uh, case study just to give you a brief overview. So what we also introduced was an online platform. One is called Together All and it's um, a peer support mental health support platform. So you can post on there at any time of the day or evening, anytime you like, of how you're feeling. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer generation of what they want, how they're feeling that it could be anything they can discuss on that on that platform. Within that, it's actually monitored by clinicians in the background. So they are one, monitoring everything all the time of what's being posted. We also then introduced a student hub, and this is also a 24-hour access um, online platform for the student services staff. And that allows us at any point we just left. that allows us at any point to engage with the students 
if they want to. If they want to book an appointment, they want to see any of our services, they can book it as and when they feel. So part of this case study really is to explain, although we do a 24 hour service, um, we offer that remotely as well with our um, security team. What happened is one of our students went on to together all. They posted that they was not in the right place mentally and that they were going to take their own life. And they'd also put the plan of what they was going to do with that. Because of the clinicians that are monitoring that, the clinicians immediately contact the authorities. So they contact the police, who then contact the university. And because we could access this anywhere, because it's on, in the cloud base, um, we then spoke to the police. We could give the police the details of the student's address, etc. And I can say safely say that that person is now well, never took their own life. And we did know that they're now thriving in university. So even just that one, one incident it's of these online platforms shows to us the key for having this support 24 hours for people to actually tell other people how they're feeling and to get that intervention, um, which we're really proud of in that sense. And I'm quite pleased that we do a 24 hour support mechanism. And it does go to show what you do need in the future, which leads us on to our next slide. So really what's next for us is we've done obviously a blended approach in how they access our services, as I just explained. But equally, it gives us the we have a UWL flex and that is where all the tuition can also be taught online. So we have more access academically as well as the pastoral care for us at, the, at that point. Uh, and for us, we're continuing to make sure that when students do need any advice or they want any support, they can reach us for a number of different ways, whether that is a walk-in service virtually, um, via Teams or over the phone or via email, whereas previously we only done uh, walk-ins or, or telephone. Uh, we're also going to be continuing to keep services which were well received by students. So that is things for, like what we created within the student union. So that is the outreach calls and the um, reset calls. We captured so many students and was able to support them there. A lot of students at that point that completely disengaged and didn't know that they had resets, just wasn't going to attempt and was just going to give up with their studies. So we was able to motivate them support them, kind of get them continuing, also identify any mental health needs um, and then signpost them over to Tracy and her team. The other part for us as an institution is really important that we was had uh, staff that are mental health first aid trained. So throughout this period, we also had 16 staff um, within my team actually mental health first aid trained. What is the plan is for the institution because we have nine academic schools and we plan to actually have a champion in each school as a mental health first aider to see any signs with any of their students and then they can pass that on within their um, academic colleagues as well. The other part of that is adapting the services towards our students. The part of adapting our services is instead of doing a traditional nine to five, you have to look at opening up what's right for the students and when do they want it. So throughout the pandemic, we opened our services from eight in the morning till eight at night and on Saturdays. Um, that's really trying to work with them of what they want rather than us just saying the whole UK is like a nine to five service. We're not a nine to five service anymore. And support cannot be bridged into a nine to five service, um, especially with your mental health. You don't know when you might go into a psychotic episode or you don't know how your depression and anxiety is going to kick in at a certain point in your life. So I think it's really important that we actually look at adapting to people's needs around their mental health and well-being. That is one of the key things. The other part as well for us is having this multi-agency engagement. We do work quite strongly with IAPT. We also have a company, it's a charity called Advent Advocate, and they help us with students with mental health conditions. They support the student outside the university as well as inside the university. So they get that whole holistic approach that the student feels totally supported while they're going through their studies, when there's things outside that can actually affect them and cause them some issues. One of the biggest things for us is bridging this gap between higher education and, and the NHS and the charities. What we have done this year, we have been successful with two bids from the Office of Students. 
So we are working very closely with West London Mental Health. We've bridged the gap with them and that's also with their recovery team. And this is about working with BAME students as well that don't always come into support. There is a certain demographics that don't don't engage with us and they may be supported in the NHS, but then they miss that gap when they come back into university. And we are trying to bridge that gap. So there's a seamlessness that that support continues if they've gone through a mental health condition at that point, that we can pick it up and work very closely with the clinicians as well. On top of all of that, I mean, finance is the biggest thing. So with that, it is about working. It's not money doesn't change everything, but not having money and having issues with your finance can cause high anxiety and stress. So it's trying to marry up all of the conditions that someone can have and what are the cause and looking at the cause and effect. That was the end of our presentation. Great, thanks very much. Um, so, um, th well, th thanks to everyone who presented. Um, just while councillors are formulating questions and um, putting, their, putting their hands up, there's a couple of things I'd like to ask. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the first one uh, arose out of that last presentation. I was very interested in the uh, the idea of the single session therapy model. Um, so really for, for, for Tracy and Olivia, do, do you think that there could be scope for uh, something similar to that outside of a higher education um, setting? Because I think certainly what you describe, you know, the, 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 the model that always seems to be used is that there's a long waiting list to um, access uh, a series of counselling sessions so the idea of having a single a single session without a waiting list and then um you know taking it from there does there seems to be a lot of strength in it do you, do you think it could be have broader applicability yeah i do i think what we look at in our counselling is if they've got some high level obviously at the new counselling and high level issues and very specific issues that is not what the single therapy is about so that is where the nhs long-term counselling which could be long-term obviously is when you've got what they call low level mood um, like anxiety or you have low level mental health, sometimes it's just talking to them for that one time. That is what they need there and then. And I think we also make sure that every day that we have two sessions, sorry, two slots available every day for a student. So when they just need to talk to someone very quick, it's there and they can talk to them. Or they can be booked the next day, if you see what I mean. Most of the yeah. time, they are spoken to immediately. And that normally alleviates that anxiety. And then it can put them back on track in their own mental state because they can start looking at plans for themselves and what they can do. And if they're in long-term counselling, some of them will be in long-term counselling, it just gives them a holding point. So I think it can because you've got clinicians that can analyse whether they need long-term counselling or it's just a mild, you know, it's just a mild flip at that, sorry, a blip at that time. And that's where sometimes the GPs, I think, could step in to sort of work out or slightly analyse, actually, you could just do with this single session. And it has worked on, you know, we've done it online, obviously, as well, through the whole pandemic, we've been doing it online. Um, and now we will be going back, and we have gone back to face to face. But I do think we need to start going away from our traditional models that it has to be a minimum of six six there are sessions if you see what I mean and just look at the person holistically of their need but that's my opinion right, um, and uh, so I so thought Lisa you put your hand up did you want to respond on this issue um yeah um uh, yeah just to say that um I I very much agree um with Tracy um obviously we're leading the um uh the council working very closely with West London Mental Health Trust and I know this comes in the next report but um we are working with our sort of safe cams team. And one of the things in terms of the redesign is they're looking at piloting a sort of one-off consultation model type counselling with a then a follow-up session. Um, so that's going to be part of our piloting. So we're very excited to look and see what the outcomes and what the impact that will have. So that's something to, to think about again in the next um, session in February. Uh, and uh, Charles was asking in the chat, uh, is is the model solution focused brief therapy? Is, is that is that a yes. particular? Yeah, right. So that's the that's the that's the 
technical term for it. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, can I, uh, Lisa, is, is is your hand up again, or is that? Oh God, no. Uh, right. So, can I take the question? I've got another question, but I'll, I'll do that later. Can I ask the take the question from Councillor Mohan, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, all the presentations have been very, very valuable. Clearly, a lot of work uh, has been happening to help uh, learners and students. Um, I really appreciate the work that has happened. Uh, I got a very simple question. It's about, uh, you have mainly mentioned about the support for learners and students. Uh, what sort of support was available for the staff? Uh, because COVID has affected all of us. So um, the pandemic must have affected the staff. So how did you support the staff itself? Thank you. Yes, it's, it's straying slightly outside our remit, but um, uh, I'll, I'll take it anyway. Um, can I who, say, who would like can to I respond to that? Something? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. say a few things actually. Yeah, for our staff, um, we very quickly, one of the things we did, we set up, I mean, we've already got a learner portal and, um, you know, online resources, as, as um, colleagues mentioned, you know, at, at West London University. And on the staff portal, we created a well-being page with all sorts of, that's how it started with tips, um, obviously access to support services. We have something called employer, the employee assistance program where you can, you can access say a one-off se session or counselling sessions if you need support. Um, but on the lower level, one of the things that was really nice on our wellbeing page with tips and exercises, links to, you know, all the people doing sort of exercise online during COVID, we had a pets corner. And because everyone was at home, you know, the amount of people, it was wonderful that were like posted pictures of their pets, you know, the cat, my cat here, you know, coming across the screen. Um, and we, we actually, we worked with um, Back on Track as well, who were working remotely and offered, sort of, they were offering um, group sessions and individual sessions to staff who might need support. And actually what we then did after the lockdown is instead of having like, um, in, at the end of June, staff training days, we had staff wellbeing days and they were all online. And so we had, um, you know, dealing with anxiety and uncertainty during COVID. Um, and we had a presentations and delivery by the, by the NHS Trust. So we had, we really tried to sort of draw in a lot of resources so that there was a real staff focus as well, because staff were brilliant. They were working around the clock and a lot of them obviously dealing with students everyone was really sort of determined to make sure we tracked and 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 oversaw and supported students and and many of them really did need support for themselves too thank you um thank you Zara. Do, do, do any of the other um witnesses want to respond on that or or if not i'll go on to uh councillor woodruff uh, i saw next Simon, are you ready to ask your question? Yeah, it's probably um, it's probably an impossible question to answer, really. I was very impressed with uh, the reports. I mean, the, the people were doing a huge amount during COVID, uh, which was a time of trauma for quite a lot of people, I think. Um, and it was always it was sort of trauma in an isol isolated settings, wasn't it, really? Because we were all on our own and some people were... Uh, suffered more than others. I, I was just wondering if you, you've got any idea of um, kind of success failure rates, whether um, you can do successes, but do, do you know of people who maybe didn't manage to treat well or managed not to get to? I don't know, so it's probably very difficult to say, really. I was, just, I was wondering how, whether you've got a sort of success failure rate type type thing at all. Okay, uh, so who would like to to respond to that? If you, I think we uh, yeah. we'll probably have a go. Um, Olivia from PWOSU. Um, so from our area, 
um, a lot of the approach that we kind of took was very targeted at the students that wasn't engaging um, because, you know, there's students that are engaged in, in, in the disability team and the welfare team, the wellbeing team, but we also wanted to target those that unfortunately could have been forgotten as just disengaged students. So we really wanted to make sure that we focused on them. When we done the outreach calls, we, we targeted these students first as we felt that they were at high risk. So um, it, it's kind of a bit of a different answer than you may have been expecting, but I think it was, we were focused very much in our approach when we were framing and, and um, conducting some of our, our projects to make sure that nobody got forgotten and to make sure that you know we, we were trying to target everyone um, as much as possible. Yeah, I think from that, because a lot of people do tend to look at the students that have declared a disability or declared a mental health condition and they really focus on that. Uh, the other approach, I think, as well, is looking at your care, uh, cared experience students and estrangement. This is where we, it is about where it's affected. There is no data that formulates from the care, ex, sorry, not the care experience students, from the estrangement, unless you actually ask a person if you're estranged. They are more vulnerable. And I think what Olivia's saying is as well, it's not always focusing on the ones that have declared something. You have to look between the lines of the ones that haven't declared anything or they don't want to declare it, which is their right. And that, that's where it's reaching your whole student body. So I think we probably, to us, a failure is not having that student complete their studies and not engaging with us would be a failure on the institution's part of where have we sort of let that person down. But we can only offer out as much as we can, to be honest. Um, that's where I'd look at the success and failure of that, if okay. that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and uh, Alison, you wanted to come back on this one as well. Yeah, I'm very much um, following with what has previously been said. Mine's a lot more straightforward in the sense that I've got a much smaller cohort. So, um, again, I will measure it on how many people have stayed engaged with the process, even though they have said, you know, they, they want to disengage, they want to stop, but we've managed to keep them going. So I think that's where we will measure our successes. On that scale. Yeah. Um, I, would Sarah. Just, I would just add to that, you know, obviously we measure on retention of students and, and their achievement rates. And actually the last two years we've had, you know, that the achievement has still been good. If for us, I think the difficulty and during lockdown is those that you reach out, you, we, you know, we target the, the vulnerable, those that we know to be vulnerable, and we try and then reach out to anyone who may become vulnerable. For me, the learner who presented perfectly well achieved and then had a major breakdown, um, for me was such an eye opener that, you know, we got the message out very loud and, and clear that you have to check in with every single learner, even if they seem okay, they may not be. Um, but it's very difficult to do that. And I guess, now that this learner is back with us and reintegrating after a year out, again, I feel, you know, that that's some measure of success that we're getting him back on, on track again. Okay, thanks. Um, are you, you happy with that, Simon? Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> right, good. Um, so I'll, now I'll take um, uh, Councillor Lissardi and then Councillor Martin, and that, then, then we need to move on to the, to the next yeah. item. Um, yeah, so yeah. Oh, sorry, you want to ask one as well. Right, okay, I'll do those three more questions and then we'll move on to the next item. Um, good, so uh, Councillor Lissardi. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, that's right. So it was a, it was a question for Olivia, um, who I think works at the ESU of the University of West London. That's right. Um, I, I, I was staggered at what you were, talk, what you were saying about the, the resit calls. You, so I think I heard you say that you, you and your colleague made a thousand re recent, recent calls, which is an enormous number of calls. But um, I'm just interested. So where I work, uh, informing students that they have a recent is is purely a sort of a, a registry function. It's the registry takes care of that, and and, and I don't think RSU gets involved in that at all. So I'm just wondering, you know, it, it, am I right in thinking the SU did this off its own bat? Did it have the blessing of the university? Um, was it funded by the university or? And were there any issues around sort of data protection or anything like that? So just wanted some more information about that, that scheme of the, the reset call. Thanks. Yeah, I, I mean, that's right. I, it was certainly something that uh, impressed me, the fact that we are having a joint 
presentation from the academic side yeah. and the union side and certainly yeah. it's a long time since I've been in higher education but in those days they really sort of didn't seem to talk to each other very much it's, it's very impressive how integrated it all is. No, there um, does seem to be a great yeah. link up between the two actually yeah you're absolutely so, right. So yeah tr Tracy and Olivia would you like to respond to that? Yeah definitely um, I mean first of all I just want to say like you know but the fact that myself and Tracy we have such a good relationship it is that it it impacts the students massively and you can see the benefits. So I'm glad that you have identified that as well. Um, yeah, so you're correct. So with the resit calls, so what happened was um, it is very much a registry side and an admin side. However, what we were seeing was students wasn't really picking up the registry and the admin side. So every student gets an email saying you've been invited to do a resit um, and they'd be given a, a number of months to kind of prepare for it. However, Due to a number of issues such as IT poverty, poor mental health, lack of engagement, students wasn't really responding and wasn't really engaging with these emails and checking their Blackboard and their My Registry. So, my, the the uh, university and the student union both identified that it was an issue. And as we had such a great um, response with the outreach calls, um, the university asked us to deliver a similar project for resits. So they was able to give us a number of students' information um, in accordance to our like policies and making sure everything was compliant. Um, and we contacted the students. We let them know that they had a deadline. Um, we let them know how many uh, deadlines they needed to meet, how many research they needed to do, and just kind of checked in. First of all, are they aware? Is there anything that we can do? We had a lot of students that unfortunately had disengaged um, and they didn't know. So we was able to kind of get them back on track and get them to submit by the, the proposed deadline, which was the 12th of September. Um, so, yeah, so we contacted, uh, I think it was a little over 1,000 students. Um, and, yeah, it, it seems to have worked really well from within. As the advice service manager, um, we're seeing a very small number of people compared to other years who are now coming saying that they weren't able to meet that deadline because we was able to catch them beforehand and raise that awareness. I and think the only really yeah, impressive, so actually. To add on that is that it only works because the university and the SU work so closely together. We do have a sharing agreement with the SU, which obviously the students are aware of, because the whole thing is about holistic approach from the whole institution and the SU as one. So, yes, they are a separate entity, but if we don't work together, then we actually fail our students, and that is the key for the institution. We have to work together with the SU to improve services and improve the structure of how the universities run, because we have to listen to that student voice. And obviously the SU is the student voice. Um, and that is the partnership we've built up over a number of years um, to get where we are today, really. Great, thanks very much. Uh, it's very impressive, yeah. So um, can I uh, ask uh, Councillor Martin, please, uh, to ask your question? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I hope you can hear me because my internet yes. seems to be a bit bad tonight. I can hear you. Um, so, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so firstly, I have to say, uh, amazingly impressed by all the work that everybody is doing. It's um, fantastic stuff. It's great to hear that's going on. Um, you, uh, to be honest, I would have thought you've got in a great position to to really have local leadership on some of these issues. And I just wondered if you were doing anything like that, for example, doing any outreach to work with local schools um, and if there's any scope for you to do that, if you're not. Um, and one other question was, um, are there any risks to the work uh, going forward? Um, things like funding or um, anything that might stop you carrying on with all the marvelous stuff that you're doing? Hey, uh, outreach and risks. Um, who would like to respond? Is uh, should I say start on the um, out, on the outreach? Um, uh, 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 in terms of, we work really closely with the schools through um, pretty much through sort of progression, looking at opportunities and through our marketing and assistant principals curriculum, um, how we can work more closely with the schools about opportunities coming in to college and particularly for learners who, you know, this new, the, the schools are identifying as a sort of risk of neat dropping out and particularly the alternative provisions 
you know, we take quite a large number from alternative provisions. But in terms of actually any of our resource going out into schools, that 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 sort of crossover work, we, we don't have the capacity beyond sort of working with schools around that kind of recruitment transition. Um, ideally, that could be something for the future. And I work very closely with both the Ealing and the Hammersmith Safeguarding Partnerships. Um, funding is always a risk. Um, you know, as a college, our base funding for a 16 to 18 learner is less than schools. You know, schools locally will probably get about 6,000, just under 6,000 per learner, maybe just over. We still get the FE rate of four and a half thousand pounds per learner. So our services within colleges are hideously stretched. And we have to sort of prioritise that funding. So I, um, you know, I really make the case strongly for, for continuing to increase and invest in our mental health safeguarding provision. But it is, it, it's, it's stretched to say the least. And that's why those professional partnerships and wraparound and joint working um, are really essential. But I do love the idea of local leadership. I think that was is really, really vital. You know, how we just sharing information tonight and hearing from, from uh, Tracy um, and, and Olivia has been really fascinating. Great. Um, well, so I think you, you've covered both halves of the question, but did, does anyone else want to add anything from uh, our other witnesses? No. OK, um, so we'll move on to the final question on these on this item, uh, which is from uh, Councillor Midher. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is very small. First of all, I want to say all the stuff they've done well. It, the briefing is really very nice. I appreciate because they explain everything they've done well. My question is, is that on the slide, partnership, they are mentioned a cooth. What's that? The other thing is that they set up a buddy scheme. Is it still is on that scheme or they have finished that scheme now? Thank you. Was the first slide mine, Cooth? Cooth, um, Cooth is an online sort of support service and count, support and counselling service for young people, um, basically. So it's something very, you know, you can have an app on your phone, you can, uh, can contact them online and, and they'll have advice online, but you can talk to someone. So Cooth is something we, we just have, you know, the link on the website, the link, I have the link, you know, on my, when I'm out of office, I put the link on. So anyone, any learner, if they email me can, can access sort of support if they feel necessary. So that's, that's Cooth. Thank I think you that's my much. part of the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and with the buddy scheme, the buddy scheme, the buddy scheme um, it's still continuing, but it's altered slightly. So because we've got in-person, uh, it's coming back to back, it's kind of moved a little bit more over to the university as we're doing like peer mentoring. So it's also having that, you know, buddy side, but then also the academic side of, you know, sometimes it can be a third year with the first year uh, to support students as well, to support each other. I mean, the other thing, because of the buddy scheme, we did... We've always had peer mentoring, but we've actually done this year now, we've been introducing more where it's, if you've got a disability, but you actually want to talk to another student that's got a disability that may be struggling in the same format as well. Mm -hmm. And equally, if you're a care experienced student and you actually want to engage with somebody that's already been in university for a year or two years, mm -hmm. and they want to also engage with how do they feel and how have they gone through that. So the buddy scheme that the ESU introduced is it really expanded our peer mentoring on site. And because we are totally back to face-to-face -to -face teaching, um, it come, it, that's why it's come back into the University of the Peer Mentoring. So I hope thank that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think that's all the questions that we've got on here. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add to... Um, the words that the other councillors um, made about uh, how impressive the work is. I mean, clearly, um, all of you presenting today have done an enormous amount to um, alleviate mental health problems that um, the, the students and apprentices uh, you are responsible for have uh, suffered during the during the pandemic. So I think you know we do want to to uh, show our appreciation for all that work. Um, and I think um, some or most of you wanted to. Uh, 
uh, Councillor Mohan is clapping. Very good. Um, so I, I, I think some all, all of you wanted to um, stay on the rest of the meeting and listen to the other presentation. So you're welcome to do that, uh, or uh, you're welcome to to leave as you as you wish. Um, so we're now. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take um, item seven and item eight together because um, the work of uh, Brentford is actually mentioned in item seven as well. So it made more sense to to combine the two. Um, so um, firstly, we're, we're going to look at the work undertaken on the mental health and well-being of children and young people in non-educational settings in the borough. And on this, we're going to hear from um, Charles Barnard, Lisa Burridge and Bridgette District Brian. Um, so is is Lisa going to start? Is that right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I am. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully. Yes, thanks. Yes. Um, okay, so we so so um just to let you know that um Br Brigitte unfortunately is not able to join us. Okay. We've now got um Megan. Um, so um, she's the Contact London Family Support Project Manager. So she's going to talk in part of this presentation and also share her case studies um, when we get to the appropriate slide because it kind of flows better, I think. Um, and then obviously we, we will mention Brentford, but they've got their own presentation. So I'm going to try and make that as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we can um, move to the first slide, please, that'd be great. Um, OK, so just to put it in context, obviously, this is, um, is, is um, a long review for children and children's mental health and well-being um, resilient services. So we've already submitted um, the first report, which actually provided all the context around COVID and everything that we know within the borough of Ealing um, that's had an impact on ch children, young people and um, on our families. Um, so that report really did also look at um, schools, what was happening within schools in early year settings. And I'm not going so so this report is just really an add on to that. And in terms of our focus, well, we've kept it as um, to the really to the services that um, both um, <clears throat> the council are either delivering or the council and um, with in conjunction with the Northwest London Clinical Commissioning Group are, are commissioning just to try and keep it more focused because there is a lot of support services and other opportunities out within the borough of Ealing. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, we just started a sort of general overview when we were thinking about um, the resources. So the, the Ealing Council have a family information service, um, which essentially all the information is here, but it's basically an online platform which allows links to um, a range of other services. So they can get information, advice and guidance on a whole host of local services and different types of support. So it can be everything from Ofsted registered childcare, understanding us accessing childcare funding, education, leisure, college, children's centres. So there's lots and lots of information out there. And there's a dedicated team that um, will provide um, additional support where people can't navigate the system. So we've given you um, that sort of the website. That's the sort of the, the, the front door to this service, if you like. Um, the Family Information Service also have a dedicated send officer, and that's basically to provide dedicated advice, support and specialist information for families and those with children with additional needs or disability. And they also offer a bespoke service to support um, um, families who are experiencing challenges in accessing services. Um, to next slide, please. So um, the, for the, um, the, the Family Information Service also manages the Ealing Families Directory, and we for that's where you can you click on that, and it goes to a link, and it has a whole host of activities and support that's available for families. Um, in terms of what we were asked to sort of talk about, one of the big things for Ealing is um, making sure that there is lots of holiday activities available for children, young people and families to access. And they produce this brochure, so they do it over each of the sort of um, holiday periods. So this is the latest one for summer. And what it does is that all providers who um, complete have to complete the council survey to ensure a quality of opportunity. And then they can find a whole different range of local clubs. Some have a very small charge, some are free. And it really depends. And then you can click through and, and find those links and for families to book on. So it makes it as accessible as possible. Next slide, please. Um, within that as well, the within that sort of resource, 
Um, what happened obviously with COVID, like all other services experienced, the Family Information Service ex experienced a huge number of calls, so much so that there was a lot around um, sort of mental health and well-being calls. So they put together a very sort of specialist page, and again, very similar to the universities, providing lots of resources and signposting for families within the borough. Um, and within that resource, we, we sort of list other services that are non-school. Um, and so we've listed the ones that, that um, we currently are, are being commissioned. So there's one called Our Time, It In Kids Times Workshop. So this was a, is a new project that's been launched and it's a sort of grant funded, um, but working on, as a pilot scheme within Ealing up until September 2022. And that's um, where we take, where there is a monthly sort of workshop. So it's very much peer-to-peer -peer community sessions, up to 15 to 20 families um, joined together. Um, but the criteria is um, one or more parents um, has a mental illness. So it's really about providing this relaxed environment where families can learn together, connect together, get support. And for the children and young people, it offers a, a sort of fun, protected space. Now, obviously, during COVID, everything was being done online. And part of the model is if they were accessing it online on a monthly basis, they get pizza delivered to their door um, to make it sort of a, a bit special and a bit different. And the idea is that this model will move from being online to being more in person. So um, Cooth, a lot of people have talked about Cooth. I think probably the only thing to say here is there's been a, a, a central procurement um, of all uh, right across the whole of Northwest London, all um, eight CCG areas. Um, and now Cooth was never formally commissioned in Ealing before, but since May 2021, um, there is a new mental health service. So that's free and accessible to everybody who's resident in any of the boroughs in Northwest London. Um, Brentford, obviously, um, the council commissions um, an engagement and learning provision from Brentford, the Young Carers Project, and they've also been involved heavily in delivering um, what we now term the HAF programme, which is the Holiday Activities and Food programme, and I've talked about that in a bit, but they're doing their own presentation, so um, I'm not going to spend any time on that. So if we could move to the next slide, please. Obviously, as well, in terms of what's accessible, and again, the Family Information Service at Ealing managed the SEND local offer, and the, the, the SEND local offer covers the whole range of um, uh, um, activities, resources, as you can see there, and I'm not going to read through all of them, um, but families are, are also um, can sign up to a newsletter so they can follow this and access it via Facebook, which is very popular. Um, they also um, offer a support, um, a bespoke support service is also available for anybody experiencing challenges in accessing services. So, and, and, and it's all about really increasing access. And again, those challenges have really been heightened during the COVID period. Next slide, please. Um, so over to, um, sorry, over to uh, uh, the, con um, sorry, I've forgotten your name, Megan. Um, so over to Megan, who can talk a little bit about the services we commission and their um, and their voluntary sector. And I, I think she's got some case studies to share. Thanks, Lisa. Um, hi. Yes. Yeah, so Contact Ealing um, is a, a, a charity that's been uh, actually in existence in Ealing for 40 years over for almost 40 years. Um, so we are commissioned by the council and by the Northwest London CCG, uh, where in, in, in terms of the work that we're doing with the council, we have a um, very small team of three volunteers and they are um, based at Dormers Wells Children's Centre and they're providing support to um, about a thousand families with form filling, financial advice, community language support groups, workshops and trainings, or training around supporting children's needs, carers groups, autism groups, um, also have an English conversation group, um, community language group, uh, monthly um, clothes bank, and um, it's just in general supporting families, to supporting parents to support the children with uh, additional needs. Um, uh, that's in the borough of Ealing. And then with our um, joint project that is funded by the Northwest London CCG, it's a pilot project and it's supporting the parents of children who are on the waiting list for a neurodevelopmental assessment by CAM. So that would be for autism or ADHD or another neurodevelopmental difficulty. Um, that project has been running since April and it's based on a, um, a sort of, a, a, a group of parents would um, be supported 
both online and in person. So they, uh, we have three groups uh, running this term uh, and we are covering the kind of issues that they may face um, around uh, things like uh, anxiety, things around, um, uh, like, and to do with sort of children's mental health. Um, the, uh, I think what we're finding is that the need has been accelerating um, throughout the pandemic and, and even more recently, um, what, what is emerging is that um, the, the needs are becoming more complex and we're hearing stories about um, that as we move into face-to-face -face delivery, um, uh, we're hearing more stories about what the, issue, the issues that families have been facing. And um, but perhaps the best way to sort of um, discuss that is, is if I give you a couple of case studies that the, the team uh, have been uh, are working on. These are families who have consented to have their details shared. Um, so the first one is a mother with two daughters, one of which has ASD and OCD. She's attending a mainstream secondary school in Ealing joint contact Ealing for a family event some years ago and then had started to attend group sessions. Uh, shortly after lockdown, frequency of her calls increased and she was beginning to ask for advice around domestic violence. Uh, we were able to advise on the right support for her and the um, and CAMS became involved. Later in the summer, the mother separated from her husband and has since then regularly contacted us for financial and emotional advice and support. Um, if I just read you a little bit about what she said, because I think it's quite powerful. She said, emotionally, the biggest change after getting in touch with contact eating was an awakening when I realised I was not alone. I was completely isolated from friends and family because I was in an abusive relationship and felt really alone. My child is 15 years old and has autism. Just meeting you at my child's school for the first time at a parent support session was an eye-opener and I was so thankful that there is hope out there. After the first lockdown, even more than before, knowing there was someone I could call, just having your number when I was really low had the biggest impact. I remember sitting in my car crying and then ringing you. It felt like a miracle in itself having someone to reach out to in that situation. Then I was put in touch with Antonia, who helped me so much with my finances. I didn't even know I could get carer's allowance. I didn't know I was eligible. As a mum, you just get on with it. Online meetings also really help. Just hearing other people's stories gives me confidence to share my own in case it helps someone else. In all these years, when I felt so alone, I wish another parent had said to me that they were also going through it. Um, so the other case study would be a mother who contacted, who contacted us for support and we're still quite actively involved in that support. She felt that her daughter wasn't being supported at school. She had, Her daughter has social, emotional and mental health difficulties, high anxiety and OCD. Um, the parent felt outnumbered sometimes at, at um, professionals in meetings. And so our family worker met with the school and parent and suggested a more impactful support package at school and a referral to Ealing Primary Centre and supported the parent with strategies at home. Um, the partnership between the school and um, the parent has improved. Um, CAMs have been included. There are now a team around the family meetings every four to six weeks and the contact family worker is supporting the parent at those meetings. Um, the family worker has also referred to other services school nursing team, bladder and bowel service, and help with financial support. Uh, the child's still struggling and the parents are looking at a new placement and our, our family worker continues to support. So again, I think echoing some of the presentations from earlier, financial situation, housing, and uh, have huge impact on parent mental health and children's mental health. And that's been um, a big part of the holistic support that our team has provided. Um, so I'll now hand back to Lisa. Sorry, yes, Lisa. Yeah. Apologies. Um, can you move on to the next slide, please? That's great. Okay, so in terms of other services that are commissioned jointly by um, the uh, CCG in North West London and also the council is Family Action Ealing ISAID, which essentially is a registered charity and provides free and partial support and advice and information on disability to families living in Ealing um, with a child up to the age of 25. So again, it's offering a similar sort of uh, array of services um, which they have, um, one of the things I think for them as well, have identified a 91% increase in um, families wanting to access their services. And amazingly, again, like everyone else, 
has really worked very hard to kind of meet that and 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 still achieve their sort of um, performance indicator in, in relation to access. So they're offering a whole range of support services. Um, and then we've also got the Log Cabin, which again, a voluntary organization and registered charity um, within eLink. And they're offering um, sort of very sort of case by case um, basis sort of services to families. And, um, and they're commissioned on a case by case basis. So if we have um, a particular family or young person who, need, who would benefit from being at the log cabin, then, then that's done on a sort of one-to-one -one basis. They're open 49 weeks of the year and, um, and they provide a sort of very positive and supportive space. Um, they also provide holiday play schemes and a Saturday club. So we do um, utilize their services on an ongoing basis. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then there's the, um, the HAF program. So you can see, um, again, if we were on the Family Information Service website page, you click on this and it would take you through. And you can see um, uh, also the brochure. So there was a bro brochure produced um, for summer. Essentially, this is a new scheme um, or an extension of an existing scheme, but um, improved access for all to um, those children who receive benefit of related preschool meals. And it was very much in response to the fact that during the lockdowns, um, lots of children um, didn't have access to um, school meals. And as a consequence, there was a there was a lots of issues around food poverty. So the aim really was to make free spaces available during the holiday period. So it's for six weeks a year, um, up to four hours a day, four days a week. Um, and in Ealing, there were identified to be 10,344 el eligible children. Um, so the Department of Education awarded um, almost one and a half million pounds to be able to put in Ealing for the council to be able to fund um, four weeks in the summer, a week at Easter, um, obviously just gone and then a, a week in the summer in the Christmas holidays sort of moving forward. So in terms of whilst a lot of the stuff in Easter was done I think online, um, this summer it's been possible for people to offer more sort of face-to-face -face and active provision as things have started to, to resume some level of normality. So in Ealing they received um, a, a series of bids from 52 providers offering a whole range of activities. I think one of them was still offering an, um, an online activity um, and with 22 schools having half-based provision um, during the summer. So the DfE, in terms of their expectations, and it was in the appendix report, there's a whole, deal, uh, um, whole list of standards they have to meet. Um, and so far, um, in terms of what was provided in summer, 98% <clears throat> of providers um, and made sure that there was a nutritional meal, because the idea is it's all about having healthy food and enriching activities. Um, providers could request additional support if they um, for a child with any kind of send, and um, and it was agreed locally that 15% of the budget would be used to support vulnerable children who were not um, eligible under the free meal the school free school meal place. And the idea was that would be about 300 to 600 places. Um, obviously, most of those schemes have only very recently closed um, on the 27th of August. Um, so the monitoring and the evaluation is all in progress. So there will be a report presently and um, a submission of activity data to the DfE. Um, next slide, please. OK, so the other things um, that, that sort of non-school based um, is very much around um, the integrated youth service. So it's three services in one will come together and they work as one whole team. Um, so that's the youth team, youth justice team and the connection services team. So obviously the youth justice team will be looking at more widely when we look at CAMS at the next report. But essentially these three teams work together and obviously during the whole of the pandemic they were offering most of their provision online. Um, I think with the exception of the youth justice um, service where there was a particular need they would see um, the child or family in person. So they offer this service 13 to 19 and up to 25 for children with disabilities. Now, the focus really is about interventions and engagement opportunities that are not for young people not in education, training or employment, as well as to um, towards supporting young people who have been assessed as requiring additional support. So in terms of, sort of health support, um, the majority of this pre-COVID was all delivered at the youth centres. So um, we've got three in Ealing. So the Young Adult Centre, the Bolo Youth Centre in Westside, and they're delivering these range of activities. Um, but obviously, 
for the majority, um, certainly up until very recently, the majority would be being delivered online. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, and, and similarly, um, the connection service was providing um, a careers advice and guidance drop-in session um, for, for young people to help them to think about their careers, um, as well as um, delivering the supported internship program um, with pathways to employment programs and opportunities and working closely with the employment skills team to deliver kickstart and the apprenticeship programs. Um, but again, a lot of that advice was given online during the whole entire period of lockdown. What's interesting now is the lockdown has eased. Um, obviously, like everyone else, it's all really about taking the learning of what's worked. Um, so the services are moving towards a blended approach. So they will be offering online, but also face-to-face um, -face interventions as well. And I think what's interesting talking to those services, it's become really, um, really clear that young people, as much as they appreciate online, um, they feel very much that they would like some more face-to-face -face contact. So currently um, there's a recruitment um, exercise going on with the view to have being able to deliver more face-to-face -face support um, from January onwards. Next slide, please. And this is really just talking about the voice of the child. And this is um, our Young Ealing Safeguarding, um, the YES group. Um, and this was formed three years ago, um, children and young people aged from 15 to 20. Um, and it really allows um, sort of service users, um, uh, uh, people have lived experience to really get involved and, and, and make sure that the voice of the child is heard. And that's really right across the board, right across all of everything that the council does in terms of thinking about young children, young people and families, development of policies, practice processes, and an ability for young people to deliver peer-to-peer -peer training. Um, lots of people have talked about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program and, um, and young people belonging to this group have done a lot of work with six formers across secondary schools to have a mentoring role. And um, when thinking about that, that really difficult time in terms of transition from primary to secondary school. And they've done all sorts of amazing things, including winning a national award um, with regards to um, their smoking campaign. Um, and they also are regular attendees at a lot of the work that we're doing. So as everything is changing and moving forward, um, towards being more part of an integrated care partnership. They um, have representation on all of our sort of key strategic meetings so that we have that going forward. They've also, we've been recently doing um, a whole period of, um, well, a whole process of redesign. Um, so we're in the process of, of looking at a whole range of services the council commission, commissions from West London Mental Health Trust. And they've been a real key part in driving forward some of that stakeholder engagement so that we really start to have an, an understanding of what young people need, want, particularly when we're thinking about the post-recovery and um, COVID period. Next slide, please. Um, so risk challenges and next steps. Well, in terms of what we sort of the services that the focus of this report, obviously as everybody's identified, huge impact of COVID, demand from services right across the board has been huge. Um, and, um, and there is a real concern if this demand continues at this level with the rising complexity that we've seen, that many of these services will be, will be beyond capacity. And certainly when we're thinking about when Brentford, I'm, I'm sure will do their presentation, we're really aware that they have a waiting list. Um, uh, and, and also, I guess the other thing that's come through, there's lots and lots of things have worked really, really well. And I think every service and, and the way in which we deliver services will completely change. But it is about having the blended approach and not forgetting that it doesn't meet all needs. So there are families, and um, particularly where English isn't, uh, isn't their, uh, first language, who um, almost online delivery um, creates more barriers than it solves. And that's not true for everybody, but for some people's experience, that has been the case. So it's just where we sort of, as we start to move forward and redesign services, we need to think about accessibility, meeting needs and providing a range of options. Funding continues to be um, an issue as has as already been identified. Um, and that's predominantly because some of the projects that we run um, are grant funded. So um, it's very difficult to know where the next um, grant will be coming. So it's quite uncertain in terms of planning. And I think that has a massive impact. So I know for um, one of the things that we've identified as a, from a commissioning perspective is 
um, the project that contacts run, running for us um, as part of the waitlist initiative with all those families who are on a waiting list waiting for a neurodevelopmental assessment for one of their children. Um, and again, that's the sort of, it's been funded, it's, it's limited funded, it was funded this year, but that project is ongoing. Um, from West London Mental Health Trust, um, Mental Health, well, West London NHS Trust um, perspective, it will go on for another year. So there's those sort of inconsistencies and, and, and the need to address those gaps. Obviously, we've got waiting lists and some of the services are already identified. And whilst um, I think, um, as everybody's identified, we're looking at different models, um, we're not completely there yet. So those waiting lists maintain. In terms of disadvantaged groups, there has been potential access issues where English is not first language. Um, and again, it, it, it's where the issue of face-to-face -face contact um, is still needed. So I guess next steps, um, lots of um, redesign um, in terms of blended models of delivery in, in order to maximize access and um, meet the current need as we know it now in the post-COVID recovery period. So that's me at the end. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so, uh, as I said uh, a little earlier, um, we're going to move straight on to um, item eight and then take questions on both. Um, so, the item eight is um, a presentation by uh, Chris Barrett and Graham Gooden on Gooden. Gooden, is that right? <laughs> Sorry, uh, on the uh, Brentford Football Club Community Sports Trust and the work they do in this area. Um, of course, our new Premiership um, team. Um, and um, it, obviously the, the work that you did, did has been uh, flagged up in the earlier presentation, but uh, we would like to uh, hear more about it. And apologies for coming to you at this very late hour. Thank you. Uh, not a problem. Thanks so much. Just uh, checking you can hear me properly because my uh, I'll keep yes. the camera off just for now, just because my connection is a bit unstable. So apologies. Um, yes. Yeah, good, well, good evening. Thanks for inviting us. Um, myself and Graham are, are just going to do a short presentation. Um, covering two projects really, um, Brighter, uh, Brighter Futures Programme uh, and also the half counts which have been mentioned. So um, yeah, just to start with, I suppose, a bit of context, a bit of background um, in terms of if my machine is going to work. Uh, does that not want to share? Uh, well, what I'll do is, I'll, if the presentation worked, I'll flick it on, but uh, it seems like it's stuck at the moment. But what, what we do, just a bit of background about the Community Sports Trust, is we uh, we use the power of sport to, to educate, motivate and inspire people from all backgrounds. So um, we offer quite a large portfolio of programmes, um, which cover different themes, different areas, including education, employability, uh, sports participation, uh, health, and community engagement. So, and we do this uh, mainly through the strength of our partnerships. Um, uh, most of our, our, our work is, is in those areas, and, and yeah, we work with over 100 schools. Um, at five boroughs we work across are, 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 of course, Ealing, Hounslow, Richmond, Hillingdon, and Spelthorne. Um, and uh, we do quite a lot in terms of our kicks and outreach programs, communities engagement, which is what Graham and his team lead on. Uh, and we have interventions. Again, it was mentioned earlier, our Young Carers project in Ealing and also Hounslow um, and also um, projects like our Deaf Sport Specific Programme, where we have a specific deaf coach um, who's able to go out and, and, and tap into those communities and get them participating. Um, really, the, the other part is the education and employability. So we run a, a BTEC at, at West End College uh, when we just started a cohort for Build, which is quite good. So we have over... Uh, 90 young people involved in that um, and we also are looking at the kickstart program uh, and have uh, some students on that some young people engaged in that uh, as well as the traineeship program which we're starting up and um, really the philosophy for us is is realizing potential um, so the the idea is that a young person can enter our organization at various projects and levels and then we can push them on uh, and have a bit of a pathway through what whatever their particular need is um, we're excited about the um, new facilities that we've got. So we've got um, Gunnersby Sports Hub, which is in Gunnersby Park. Um, and we've got the, uh, within that sports hub is a sports centre, uh, which I'm sure you'll be aware of, as well as um, sports pitches, 3G pitches outside where we can run a host of activities, particularly around holiday times and half camps. 
uh, are an example of that. The social education hub is one that's really exciting for us. That's the uh, facility that is just about to, to go live. Uh, we're waiting on the keys for that one, but we've been busy with um, uh, the architects and uh, to get that, that up and running. Um, absolutely welcome conversations with partners about the best way to utilize it. Um, we've obviously got projects that can fill the space, but we're also looking at other areas to, to best suit the communities and the young people that we work with. So um, the, the, the third one is, is our Uxbridge Dome, which we've got within uh, Uxbridge High School, which again offers us a, an indoor facility uh, that we're very able to utilize for various projects. Um, the main point of, of this evening was Brighter Futures. Now, Brighter Futures is uh, we've been running um, uh, via commission uh, from Ealing for about seven years now. I think this is our seventh year. Um, not big numbers. Um, it originally started off at about 100 young people, but uh, it soon became apparent that the need was far too complex uh, and we reduced that down. So um, how that works is we work with the safe team. Um, uh, and the idea is that we provide positive activities uh, for children, young people in care and at the edge of care. Um, the, the main uh, point of it is, is that we'll support the managing uh, behaviour, social, emotional needs. Uh, and assisting children and young people with strategies uh, when dealing with difficulties within the family. So we, we will get these referrals through. We have uh, at the moment on, on our caseload, I think was mentioned Le by Lisa, uh, quite a large waiting list. So um, we're commissioned to work with 12 young people across the year. What the level of support that, that those young people receive can be anywhere from a month to six months. Uh, so invariably we will go above that number. Uh, last year, for example, we had 21 uh, young people that we work with. Um, uh, what we're seeing, again, has been quite, quite an obvious uh, thing, I guess, is that more complex cases that we're receiving um, and more um, young people that are working with us over six months. Um, so that's inevitably why we've got a waiting list. Um, uh, the idea and how that works is in terms of the process, the safety team are, are refer so we'll have a member of staff who coordinates on our side and and, in, and they, they embed themselves within the safe teams the east and west uh, which really helps with those referrals so we're able to get the, the full extent uh, uh, from the young people uh, sorry from the professionals uh, from speech and language therapists social workers child psychologists um, so we're able to tailor the work that we do for for those uh, for the young people in terms of the activities that they would do, they could do anything. Obviously, the sports element is a big draw, uh, but it doesn't need to be. Um, we, we can do things like circuit training, boxer size, football is big. Um, these are all one-to-one -one sessions, but there is also an option of group sessions uh, if the young person is ready. And again, um, I mentioned the pathway approach um, for young people. If we think the young person's ready and they're, they're keen to do it, we can put them onto other projects and, and point them towards other other areas so um yeah it could be that they just want to walk and talk with the coach um we've got a young person that just walked around the uh, the, the, the block with the young persons uh, with a, one of our coaches so um it just depends it's got to be absolutely tailored it takes it takes time to build up trust which is key in this um the young person not just going to trust somebody in a tracksuit unfortunately uh it normally takes on average about two months to build up that trust with them effectively so that we can then start to to put strategies in place to help uh, re-engage them um, back into the school, into society. Um, so in terms of, I can't really share, it's a shame I can't share my screen, but in terms of the activity, uh, the types of referrals, these will range from um, ADHD, um, ADD, edge of education, as we've said, uh, young carers, uh, school refusers, domestic, uh, those that have been involved in domestic violence, uh, um, anger management, um, uh, exclusion, uh, complex family backgrounds, uh, vulnerable to exploitation, that could be child sexual exploitation uh, or otherwise. So, and it could have uh, most of the time, the young persons, uh, young people that are referred have multiple um, needs. So is it, many of which are undiagnosed, which we're finding. So um, I think we're, we're managing as, as we go along and working with professionals uh, where we can to try and identify these and point them in the right direction. Staff themselves are, of, uh, are are tied into TAF meetings, team and family meetings, so we can we have input to education, health and care plan um, for that young person. Um, but they are 
you know, we will put strategies in place where we can, but invariably we have to move them on. Um, last year, as I said, we had 21 cases that, that, that we worked with um, and about 80 and 90, well, I'd say 90% of those were positive um, uh, outcomes for that young person. So the, the, their cases were able to be closed. Um, just in terms of um, a quote, uh, a bit of a case study, there's, uh, I would, it's always good to hear from, from the young people themselves. So uh, I'll read this quote out very quickly. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done. You really have helped from the very beginning of the sessions to the very end. You found a way to make me laugh, help me regain the confidence to start playing football again. And I'd just be happy with the small things in life. But yeah, this is not goodbye. And I'll be coming to the football sessions again. I just want to say a massive thank you. The sessions really did help a lot. Uh, that's from a 15-year-old who was, uh, had, had um, uh, witnessed DV in the family. Very low self-esteem, anxiety, borderline depression. Uh, was at school, but just struggling because he, he, he was jumping from school to school. So um, just gives you a bit of an example of... of um, uh, of some of the young people we work with. The good thing about that young chap is he's, he's actually attending our CE sessions, uh, as he said in that quote. So that's a really positive uh, element. And hopefully we're going to put him onto our tra traineeship, pointing him in that direction as well uh, when he's ready. So uh, that, that gives a bit of a background. Graham, I think, you, you, again, we I can't really share this presentation. So um, I think you can just jump on and say a few things about how, the half camps. Yeah, I mean, just, sorry, just just to reassure you that um, we got the presentation in our agenda pack. So um, we have got the, even yeah. though they're not on screen uh, for people watching on YouTube, the members of the committee do have the uh, the, the, the slides. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gooden? Uh, Graham Gooden, are you there? Okay, so it it's a drop looks off, like I think. we've got a problem. Yeah, that's right. It looks like okay. it's on call, but it's... I'll, I'll, I mean, I think the half camps have been uh, mentioned before by Lisa. I think. Um, hello. Again, oh, hello, Am Graham. Here? You are. Yeah, we can hear. We can hear you now, Graham. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I was, I, was, I, was, I was telling you to unmute, but for some reason, nothing was going through. <laughs> the, the the age old computer says no. Um, so yeah, no, the half program we've been involved now since the Easter part, the Easter pilot. Um, back in Easter, we ran it at Dormers Wells and uh, Gunnersbury Park Sports, and we engaged with over well over fifty people, fifty young people, all who were who were, in, who were identified as being those at the most need of receiving of receiving the free activity. As uh, Lisa mentioned earlier about the, there was certain criteria we had to meet, and obviously we had to provide. Uh, a nutritionist meal that met the school, school food standard. We had to deliver a certain amount of, of, of four hours of minimum of four hours delivery of sporting activity, um, along with a enrichment activity. Um, and then, obviously, after the success of that, we were then we went on to the summer program. The summer program, we've engaged with over 136 young people over over the three weeks that we delivered. Again, this was at Dormers World. Uh, this was at the Muslim Leisure Centre, not high school this time, and Gunnersbury Park Sports Club. Um, we provided young people with a lunch at both camps and of, um, breakfast at Dormers Wells on top of the lunch. And then at the end of both camps, they all got sent home with whatever food was left over, um, which on the days ended up being quite a lot. I had overordered, but it went to a good home and more, more than just the young people on the day benefited from that. So there was no complaint here from anyone, anyone that was receiving it. Um, the the activities that we that we ran on the day during the summer were anything from like dodgeball, football, rugby. We we done NFL with a I don't know if anyone knows it, the Nerf darts, the the bone javelins that you can use in, in schools. The how to throw javelin. We were using those instead of rugby, uh, American footballs. Uh, dodgeball, like I said, um, and then we also had over the summer we had Mind come down and take part. And, every five-minute workshop on the benefit of what and getting what the benefit is of getting the right food in your, in your diet rather than just like rather than just uh, junk food and you know, the non-nutritional stuff so as we had them come down and talk about the benefits of eating this sort of thing, eating eating chocolate for instance, they may give you an initial 
nicety in it. You know, it's it's enjoyable, but actually, there's no there's very little nutritional value in it. And again, with like sweets and stuff like that, so they talk about that. It was something called mood and food. Um, and then on top of that, we also delivered this across Hounslow as well. So it wasn't just in Indian with a majority of the time, but yeah, over the summer we engaged with over across the four NAF camps in Hounslow and Ealing, we were engaged with over 300 young people. Um, yeah, I think that's it from me from the half point of view. Um, mm -hmm. Great. Good. So th thanks very much to, to Chris and Graham. Um, so I'm now going to open up to questions on um, both items seven and eight. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a question. It's primarily to Lisa. Um, the, is, is the, um, I mean, clearly that there are the services um, tend to be focused on um, young people who've been identified as having, you know, quite specific needs um, and just sort of, Looking back at the 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 presentations in the previous items um, about facilities for um, for students and apprentices, is there is there is there a gap? Do you think in the provision for young people who aren't in education um, who have um, low level um, mental health, you know, issues like anxiety, you know, so that they who would be um, helped by the sorts of services that we've we've heard about for apprentices and um, and students, but um, in terms of general provision, you know, we've got um, we've got youth centres which which only reach a uh, you know quite a limited proportion of the young people in the borough, and we've got the great work that's done by Brentford, but again, it's it's, it's relatively small numbers. Do you think do you think there's a do you think there's a gap there? And do you think that there might be any way of addressing that? I'm oh, sorry, you're on mute. You're talking particularly about those that are sort of 16 plus that have left school. Is that the group that you're sort of identifying? Yeah, that, that, that's right. So, so people who aren't at school, so they don't have the services that are delivered through the school framework, but they're also not in another environment, um, you know, so that they're, they're not in further or higher education either. So they're either in employment or their needs um i think i think it kind of depends it kind of depends because obviously all of those um young people that aren't in education there is obviously automatic access and referral so i think if you're looking at something like the online service the family information service provide they do provide support and they do signpost so in, in terms of like summer activities, some of those are free and they're accessible because it's all done on age rather than um, and, and necessarily need. And some of those are free, but some of them do cost. Um, and obviously you can, you can um, be referred at any point by, um, it doesn't need to be through school, you can be referred by your GP. So you've got all of the other CAM services, there's other voluntary um, sort of agencies that will provide some counseling and support. Um, outside of the, of the school framework. Um, I guess I don't probably, I don't know what the numbers are that, that I, I mean, Charles probably knows better than me, yeah. Yeah, hey, Charles, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come in there. So we do track um, children not in education in a variety of ways. And um, the numbers are quite small actually in Eden post 16, because we do, um, try to keep most into employment, education or training. There are some um, that, like you said, it, you can never say never. So there are some young people that are out of provision for a variety of reasons, um, but we do keep lists of those. We do know them and we do contact them. So if, even if they're elect electively home educated, for example, we, we will be contacting them regularly. Um, but yeah, it's something we work on, but it's, it's not a complete gap. And as Lisa said, they can still get referred into all these services. They can still access, um, you know, all the services that we've discussed today. It's not that they're required to be in education for these services. They can access them anyway. So I hope it's part of an answer to your question. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, right. So do I have any questions for, the, for these two reports together from any of the other councillors? Uh, yes, I do. From Councillor Woodruff. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a. <clears throat> um, I mean, we, we're talking about young people with uh, lots of trauma. I think fairly soon we're going to be um, hosting a number of people who come from Afghanistan. <laughs> Maybe lots of children with uh, 
considerable trauma from a different cause. Um, I, I think um, I think when lots of people came from Somalia, I think there were a number of younger people who um, had trauma and maybe were not caught. You know, um, I sort of wonder if we've got a plan of what we're going to do. Obviously, they, they probably don't speak English at all, but it seems to me that um, we ought to have some plan to um, with regard to them. I mean, that might be, that's gone different from, from different from what we're talking about, but I think it might be quite important in the long run. Uh, Charles, I think you wanted to answer that. Yeah, thank you. So um, we are tracking all the new arrivals from Afghanistan and we've got a list of services that we're putting them in contact. The real difficulty and challenge here is they may not stay in the Eden. And so although we can control the service offer when they're here and if they settle here, that's great. But obviously they're being moved to other parts of the country as well, or they might be moving to family in this country. So it's quite a live situation. It's a really good point. Um, the numbers so far haven't fed through um, as uh, in terms of those families with children as large as we initially expected, but we're tracking that closely. So yeah, it's a very good good thought. And I don't know if there's a role for Brentford in terms of you know clearly the advantages of, of the sports element is that it, it doesn't doesn't require a lot of language skills. It's something that you know people can get straight into. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, there's a number of services we can link people into. The problem is, is the housing situation and, and, and a lot of the, the situation is quite fluid. Um, so while they're in Elim, we can give them um, the offer that we have. Obviously, if they get moved on, we will link with um, the receiving authorities. Right. And Lisa, did you want to add something? I think you were yeah, sorry, the, yeah. um, some of some of our teams sort of locally um, are looking at. So one of the things they've been doing is offering um, sort of webinars, which is more about accessing services, but they're offering them in different languages and signposting and all posters written in those languages. And that is um, a piece of work that's being worked on at the moment so that we can offer something that's online that allows people to understand what's available as well. So again, just helping with that signposting. I mean, I think Afga there isn't there isn't an Afghan language. They put the Pushto and Dari and yeah. Uzbek and there's, there's various yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that, that is another issue. But I think if you if you've got the interpreters and you can do it on a live session, you've got somebody who can um, speak several languages. And that's how we've been doing it when we've been addressing some of the other sort of key um, languages um, to try and improve access for those um, families. So it's just really having somebody or, or several interpreters who can do that. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, um, so I'm not um, I'm not seeing any more indications from members. I think it, it has got rather late, and uh, I think members' the desire to ask questions sometimes uh, reduces but ra rapidly when it hits nine o'clock. So um, you know, I think we um, yeah we appreciate the presentations on everything that you're you're doing, and we'll um, look in terms of recommendations at our uh, at a following meeting. Um, so that the the, the last uh, the last item on the agenda uh, is the work program, but as I say, as it is late, I uh, propose that um, that we just note that rather than uh, discussing that in any detail, unless any member violently objects to that. Well, no. well, well, yeah. well we, we, we're thinking of having a site visit. Are we, are we still going ahead with a site visit? So, or we... Yes, that's right. So, uh, yeah, the idea is to do site visits between this meeting and the next one. So um, I think you've already, well, you've already indicated you've got lots of availability. Um, so, so yeah, um, if... if um... I've, I've retired from work, so I've got, yeah, so yeah. a lot more flexible than I used. Yes, that's right. So um, uh, that's right. I'm not sure, Hajit, um, have, you, have you asked all members about availability or... Or, or just me and Simon so far? Uh, uh, so I'm uh, just waiting for some indicative um, uh, dates from you, Chair, yeah, which fine. I'll then put to the rest of the panel. Fine. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I'll get I'll get back to you, and uh, Simon's available anytime. So um, yeah. So we'll circulate those to the rest of the members, and so we can organise. As I say, the idea is to have the uh, visits between this meeting and the next one. Good. Good, great. So um, yeah, if there's nothing else um, on the on the work program, 
Um, it's just a day for the next meeting uh, is seven o'clock on Wednesday, 2nd of February. Uh, so I apologise, uh, we have gone on a bit long. I um, was keen to to hear all the um, the witnesses that we that we had, uh, but perhaps I've uh, squeezed too much into one meeting. Uh, yeah, but I think one more thing is, is very meeting. valuable. There is a meeting before February, I guess. What was that, sorry? There's a meeting before the February one, I guess. Uh, that's what it says, date of next meeting. No, or not. Yeah. it is on the 2nd of February. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. That's Yeah, yeah that, so that was the thinking, was because there's such a, a long gap between the meetings that now would be the right time to do site visits. So, so that was, yeah, that was the thinking of that. Yeah, good. Okay, well, um, I will declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. That's, that's attended. Just, Thank just you. to briefly say, I think... Sorry. Um, I think Councillor, I don't know if Councillor, you ever got apologies from Councillor Burke, but I think she was at the other meeting that uh, uh, I was at. So I think she probably stayed. We can add her, okay, we can add her on to apologies. I didn't, I didn't receive any. No, yes, we have received, Jet. Oh, I didn't. Oh, sorry, did I miss, yes. did I miss that out? Oh, no, sorry. You, no, you did mention it. I did mention it. Yes, yes. I thought I'd put it in my notes. Yeah, yeah. okay, good, good, great. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm not going mad. Excellent. Um, good. Okay. Um, so thanks. Thanks very much to everyone. And I'll uh, declare it closed at that point. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Bye. 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 Bye.